Hey there. Uh, we're in between rain spells right now. It's been raining a ton here lately and there's some thunder. But I wanted to show you the garden. A lot has changed since the last time I brought the camera in the garden when I did uh, the green bean video. So um, here we go. I said we've been getting a lot of rain. Um, one thing you can do that I think is helpful on your homestead after a really rainy period, go out and look where the water is pooling. So there's water that's ponding right here and it extends out this way probably for a number of reasons. Uh, there might be a little bit of compaction there, but also that's a low spot. So what I plan on doing uh, before I plant this for the fall is building that um, this area right here up with some additional soil to kind of get my plants roots up out of the ground so I'll probably use some uh, cheap bagged com composted soil kind of mixture uh, mixed with some of my living compost that I have in the back so that's one thing to look for after rain um, all right so first of all <laughs> got a few weeds right now I'm just trying to keep up with the tomatoes um, I can't ever seem to get around to getting enough weeds to keep them beat back so uh, this area in particular is kind of bad but this is what's left of the 42 day tomato as I expected there's not a lot of good longevity there um, this is one of the yellow tomato varieties that I purchased uh, I didn't grow any yellow tomatoes I grew an orange one I'll show you that in a minute and my mother especially requested yellow tomatoes so um, I purchased a few of those and they're far enough behind on the timeline that I don't know that they're going to make it. We get we get so much heat and humidity here that you really want your tomatoes to start being ready uh, in June, really. You want to start picking tomatoes in June. Otherwise, if you get into that July, August time frame, uh, they start to get eaten by bugs. They get eaten up with wilts and bacteria and you don't get a very good harvest. So, all right, uh, I believe that that plant and then these two plants are beefsteak and those are indeterminates, I believe, and I was able to keep those pruned back. This is Malabar spinach and it's doing really good. I haven't probably haven't picked it enough. I've picked it just two or three times for dinner. And uh, one time I made cream spinach with it and it was phenomenal. So that's a really good substitute. Malabar spinach is not related to um, regular spinach, traditional spinach, but it is an excellent hot weather alternative. And it does vine. I've been trying to train it up the trellis. It doesn't really seem to want to go up there, but I'm sure if you uh, looped some twine around it and sort of guided it. I think it would do a lot better. Um, let's see. I don't think that's one of them. Um, so this one right here is supposed to be Burpee Longkeeper. And I'm really disappointed with the size. I was hoping this would be um, the kind of tomato that you get at the grocery store that has a really good storage life. And plus... I know this is gross, but my husband likes those tomatoes. Uh, the firmness, as it's starting to ripen, it definitely has that firmness. And this is about the ripeness that I would pick these. You don't want to wait for this particular kind to get totally ripe on the vine because it'll actually start rotting. Um, these right here are early girl. These four, these are doing really good. Um, I was able to keep those pruned back early and uh, these are continually getting ripe. Where I live on the Gulf Coast, we get almost 70 inches of rain a year, sometimes more. And I mentioned several times already heat and humidity. You really can't let the tomatoes get vine ripe. If you let them get vine ripe, there are just too many things that eat them. Uh, the birds actually don't bother my tomatoes. They do an excellent they'll probably eat them all up now that I said that but they do a fantastic job of eating caterpillars and pests 
all sorts of things in the garden. So I actually encourage wild birds uh, into my garden by setting a bird feeder um, over by the house. Uh, so we cannot let our tomatoes get super ripe. Then also with the flashy rain events we have, you will tend to get some cracking no matter how evenly you've watered your tomatoes. That's an ugly example. I'll show you this one. Um, this is a variety called Orange Caprice. This particular specimen has had some root issues. Um, it did get blown over the other day. The whole cage did. So I'm thinking that's why it's growing those adventitious. Um, you can see some of those root nodules right there. Adventitious roots all along the stems. Um, I did not realize when I planted this variety that it was an indeterminate. So I did not keep it pruned back. So it was a huge mess. I did do some heavy pruning, uh, but you see there's already um, some disease that I need to clip off. And that just, that happens this time of year, no matter what you do. And there's really no point in trying to spray too many fungicides because it just won't work. The, the conditions are too difficult for the plant to thrive in. So this is Orange Caprice. It is an orange paste tomato. And I made a really delicious uh, tomato sauce with that just the other day. There's a real pretty orange caprice tomato. And I have Roma tomatoes. Some of them are quite disease ridden. Um, some of them not so much. This got attacked by some caterpillars. And um, it's got some stink bugs on it now. I did spray it. I sprayed it with seven to kind of knock some of that back. You can also use dipple powder but we have two different kinds of caterpillars that tend to get our tomatoes and one of them is um, very resistant to the dipple powder. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. There is a hummingbird. Oh my zinnias. Oh. <laughs> what a special wonderful treat. <laughs> that was so awesome. I love hummingbirds. They're so sweet. And I'm so excited that um, I planted those zinnias there and the hummingbird is using them so that's that makes me really happy. Alright, so all these are Romas. Um, I ran out of my sturdy cages so I had to end up using some of these. In bad years this is fine when I have Roma tomatoes that don't really do any better than like maybe these two down here. But in good years where they get massive, like this one, it's just that size cage is just not sufficient for most of the tomatoes. Um, this is Aroma. Some of these are from hybrid seeds that I saved. Yes, you heard it right. Everyone says you cannot save hybrid seeds. You absolutely can. You're just going to get genetic variability in what it produces. Should still be a pretty good tomato though. Um, there's a little pile of tomatoes that I picked yesterday that I didn't get. Whoops. Had my finger on the zoom the whole time. There's a little pile of tomatoes I picked yesterday that I didn't realize I left out here. So I got to grab those when I picked today. Um, got some pruning to do. And this time of year, it's a losing battle. I prune, I turn around, it's right, it's right back diseased again. So, and again, I don't worry about spraying it. Um, I might try to spray with some copper since that's organic, but I don't know how much that's going to help. I'm going to have to stake this tomato plant up uh, when I get done filming. I've already done that with this one. See that basket fell over. These are aromas. And the disease is starting to set in. This, is, this one's pretty bad. Um, and I haven't pruned these in probably four or five days. So once it gets like this, I have to prune at least once a week to get all the diseased uh, tissue off. And then hopefully also at that time we're coming up on when they finish. So they should be done. The romas, the determinants should be done in a couple weeks. Um, there they are. And these I've been able to keep them pruned from the get-go because they're indeterminate. So I may change my mind about not liking indeterminates after this year. We'll see. Right here we've got, look at this water. I changed into the boots because I was getting, so this is our low spot I was talking about at the beginning of the video. Um, 
Here we have our mushroom basket tomatoes. And this is an heirloom determinate variety and I'm really pleased with these so far. Uh, they are starting to get disease damage, but not, I mean, not overly so. So I'm actually pretty happy with the performance. Um, this one's gonna need, this one's gonna need to be tied up. Here we have um, some that I just picked before this last uh, flash of rain came in. So it's a pretty pink tomato. And what I do is I pick them at that stage when they're not fully ripe and then I take them in to finish ripening on the table. I was able to get my purple sweet potatoes planted last weekend. I did suffer from heat exhaustion after I finished that task. I had to lay down for two or three hours in the dark <laughs> in order to recover. Um, I've got my squash right here. It's, it's really been too hot for it to bloom. A lot of plants, especially uh, Western world type plants, what we are used to having in our in American type gardens, they are not going to be able to set fruit over 85 degrees. So we've actually had several days where the heat index was 100 or over 100 and several days where it was 95, 96 degrees, several consecutive days. So we've had lots of yucky heat. Um, so they haven't been making any squash, but, and they did have some squash vine borers that had um, tried to set up shop, but I did spray them with seven. Uh, if you have to use chemicals, my advice is to use the chemicals at night, um, right after the sun goes down or just as the sun's going down and before I do that, I will go through and pick any flowers for my squash that will be blooming the next day. That way the pollinators aren't even attracted to them because the pollinators are looking for flowers. If you pick off all the squash flowers the day that you spray, um, you don't have to worry about harming the pollinators. This is blue corn right here, and it probably does need to be fertilized, but I just don't know if I feel like it. I've got too much other things to do. Um, I was picking this when that last storm rolled up and I was waiting for it to finish. So I've got some cucumbers that are way too big right here. What you can do with cucumbers that are this size that are much too big for pickling size, uh, you'll find that they make great dill spears. So um, insert picture of dill spear here. Uh, yeah, so that's obviously not the goal size for your pickle, but if you're doing dill spears or the sandwich slicers, you've seen Vlasic do those, that's actually the perfect size. Here's a weird little heart-shaped pickle, or, <laughs> I'm sorry, that was inappropriate. Um... <laughs> cucumbers um, this patch is pretty much done it's not happy and I've let these get way too big so that's where I started down there um, started storming